All right, welcome back to Young Turks. And I now have a legendary environmentalist in studio with me, Bill McKibben. Bill, you know, I I don't use legendary lightly. So you're the founder and senior advisor to 350.org. But I just want to go through your resume for a second because it's fun. So he won the Right Livelihood Prize in 2014. That's considered the alternative Nobel. Uh, my favorite is he won the Gandhi Prize in 2013, Thomas Merton Prize, another one of my favorites, honorary degrees from 18 colleges and universities. I don't know how you do that, like, but I'm I'm interested. So let's talk afterwards, <laughs> okay? But obviously, one of the leading voices of the environmentalist movement in this country. Uh, in fact, Boston Globe declared you the leading voice. Um, so it goes on and on. Uh, but I think I've embarrassed you enough. Yes. Uh, so welcome, first of all. <laughs> it's good to be with you. You know, I mean, one of the things that um, makes you uh, uh, leading voices just sticking around for a long time. Mm-hmm. This is this month marks the 30th anniversary of the end of nature. The book I published in 1989 that was the first book about climate change. 1989 seems a very long time ago. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, it is a very long time ago. I mean, the planet had. Fifty percent more sea ice in the Arctic then. Its oceans were markedly less acidic. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef was still intact. I mean, I've gotten old over the course of thirty years. That's what's supposed to happen. But planets are not supposed to get old in the course of a few decades. That's the abnormal, horrible thing that's underway right now. Yeah, and so uh, you have been leading on that front uh, for quite some time, and uh, I. I've been following, and mm. so I'm actually a late follower. I've talked about this on the show a lot. Um, I did not believe in climate change in the beginning, and so, and I was a Republican back in 1989, and so I would see th- things like your work and go, "Oh, no, nah, that's not <laughs> that, that can't possibly be true." What I'm stunned by, Bill, and we're going to get to how we're going to change things. Mm. I think that's the most important part of this conversation: how we can actually get real change in yep. the world, uh, but. What I'm stunned by is people's intransigence. So the jury came in in those 30 years. Even right. for a knucklehead like me who started out as a Republican who didn't believe it at all, it was record year after record year after record year. And we're now 17 years in, it was 16 out of the, the 16 hottest years ever or the, in the last 17 years. If you can't convince somebody after that, is there any hope at all? Well, I mean, so A, the good news is that most people now are convinced. Even in America, which is the only place in the world that climate denial has a strong foothold, we're up now around 70% of people who Mm -hmm. know what's going on. It's gone up a lot in the last few years because, you know, things keep catching on fire, flooding, you know, whatever. The other 30%, look, have a little sympathy for some of them anyway. 30 years ago, we now know from great investigative reporting, the LA Times and Columbia Journalism Review and Inside Climate News, we now know that the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change in the 1980s. And they set out on a deliberate and expensive operation to build this architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation. Uh, you know, to, to, we spent 30 years in a f- completely phony debate about whether or not global warming was real. A debate both sides knew the answer to at the beginning, just one of them was willing to lie. But if you have that much money to spend on a lie and you just keep repeating it over and over again, yeah, I mean, it's not surprising that 30% of people end up befuddled by things. Yeah, look, I wanna tell the audience one quick thing here because um, I'm a casualty or I was a casualty of that propaganda war. So. The oil companies knew they were lying to me when they convinced me climate change wasn't real. They knew they were lying. I mean, literally, like Exxon in the 1980s began to build all its drilling rigs to compensate for the rise in sea level they knew was coming. They just didn't tell the rest of us. They <laughs> told us just the opposite. Right. So, like in a sense, don't feel bad if you got lied to in a, because they spent billions of dollars lying to you and and it worked. And it also worked on me, it worked on a lot of people. But on the other hand, understand that this is not a genuine debate. 99% of the world's scientists did not get together and launch a conspiracy to change the temperature readings all across the world and just have decided because of China or government 
contracts or whatever insane theories out there. It, it is. Was, it was such a good conspiracy that they persuaded the Arctic to go along with them. You know. <laughs> and, I mean, look. I don't know if it's like the moon landing and they're faking the in the in the conspiracy world, the 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 glaciers falling into the ocean, etc. But but Bill, that does really go to another part of the problem here, yeah. which is. The mainstream media, which mm. I think has gotten better, mm. but still has a lot of work to do. Because the reality is, when someone says that climate change is not real, that is a deeper and more insane conspiracy theory than almost any other conspiracy theory out there. Because it would involve literally millions of scientists from across the world getting together and inventing temperature readings and let alone everything else. Like that is the stupidest, dumbest conspiracy ever. <laughs> you should literally be thrown off the air and say this guy's a liar and he's being paid to lie to you. But yet the media goes, finally we've gotten to a point where they're like, well, it's you know, it's not 50-50. So so it was not the media's finest hour. And even good institutions fell into lazy habits for a couple of decades of just treating it as a he said, she said thing and not digging and 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 that was really bad and harmful. I will say, in the last few years, an awful lot of great reporting has gone on now about climate change. And I know this because I feel so grateful for it personally. The first, I don't know, first decade or so, um, uh, it was lonely business being, you know, I mean, there was a pretty, if there was an article in any major publication about climate change, there was an altogether too good chance that it was written by me for about 10 years. <laughs> and, and, and I'm so grateful now for the great reporting that's going on. Um, yeah, it comes late. I mean, we're no longer going to stop global warming. That's not one of the options. The question now is, can we stop it short of the place where it just cut civilization off at the knees, and even that's not at all clear. So let's talk about some of those circumstances, and then I promise we're gonna get to, yep. how, to how to fix it. So uh, can you tell folks uh, what why you named the organization 350.org? Sure. Uh, 350 is the most important number in the world, it's just no one knew it until uh, about 10 years ago when Jim Hansen, the greatest climate scientist there's ever been, uh, uh, published a paper saying 350 parts per million CO2 is the most you could safely have in the atmosphere. That's a tough number because we were already past it even then, you know, and now we're at 410 parts per million and going up three parts per million per year. That's why California burns, that's why the Arctic melts. Um, uh, but that's why we took that name so that we could organize around the world. Uh, Arabic numerals cross linguistic boundaries easier than English words. And we have, over the last 10 years, we've organized about 20,000 rallies in every country except North Korea and helped lay the foundation for this global movement that you now see beautifully expressed in things like the youth climate strikes and so on and so forth. It's very exciting to watch that movement just keep growing and expanding. So what happens when we get to 420, 450, 500? Because well, we're inexorably yeah. headed in that direction. Yeah. I mean, nothing good is the answer. Um, look, we've raised the temperature of the planet one degree Celsius so far, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That turns out to be enough to melt the Arctic. That turns out to be enough to make the oceans 30% more acidic. That's what allows you to have, because warm air holds more water vapor than cold, rainstorm in Houston two years ago that dropped 52 inches of rain, setting the new American record. 52 inches of rain, that's a lot of rain. Um, um, we're gonna go, we're headed for, even if people kept the promises they'd made in Paris, which obviously one big player has decided not to do, we'd still go to about three degrees Celsius, better than five degrees Fahrenheit, closing in on six degrees Fahrenheit. If we do that, we just, you know, Katie, bar the door. I mean, we can't have a world like the one we're used to. To give you one small example, look at the way that a million refugees coming out of Syria fried the politics of Western Europe, and a million refugees arriving on our southern border fried the politics of this country. Now take into account that the UN estimates that on current trajectories, we could see a billion climate refugees this century. Multiply 
the discombobulation we've already seen by a thousand times and imagine what kind of world we're living in. So I've always assumed that South Beach was gonna be underwater in my lifetime uh, and now it's beginning to flood when rain it doesn't rain. rain. Yep. Um, and so I think that actually every regular person I've talked to that's not in the news business, that's not in the science business, you tell them South Beach is flooding without raining and it just rocks their world. They yeah. can't, that blows their mind and it begins for them to understand the issue yep. at hand. So I mean, I know that this is a totally wild guess and I, we shouldn't even have this conversation. But what's your sense of like, when do we start losing major cities like Miami? Right, well, I mean, we're, we're losing them insidiously now to the rise in sea level, which is causing sunny day flooding across places. And, and as that continues and it's accelerating, we also, I mean, I mean look, Cities like Miami are now like pins in a bowling alley set up for the next huge hurricane. Uh, you know, we, you remember you put up on your screens the weather maps of Hurricane Dorian heading at category five strength to straight at Miami until 50 miles offshore, it, wind pattern shifted and it went straight north. Talk about literally dodging a bullet. I mean, that's the world we now live in. Uh, and Every day, somebody's not dodging the bullet. Every day, there's a big, I mean, you know, we're in California today. I mean, last year, there was a city literally called Paradise that literally turned into hell and it took half an hour, you know? That's mm -hmm. the world we live in. Yeah, so let's talk about solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so what's our theory of change for getting anything passed in Congress? So look. <laughs> The problem in Washington is not just that you know people are slow and Republican. It's that the power of the fossil fuel industry is so great that it's been able to prevent meaningful change. I mean, the Koch brothers, now brother, our biggest oil and gas barons, own a political party. Mm -hmm. That makes it difficult to get things done. Thank God the young people from the Sunrise Movement are hard at work pushing the Green New Deal and understanding that you're gonna need to change who holds office in Washington to have some chance of making that happen. That process is underway. So is the fight to go after the other major power center in our world. It's Washington and it's Wall Street. Those are, for Americans, the shorthand for understanding where power lies. I just had a piece in the New Yorker uh, about the way that the big banks and insurance companies and asset managers are really the supplier for the fossil fuel industry. Chase Bank, Rainforest Action Network had great numbers. Chase Bank spent, lent $196 billion into the fossil fuel industry in the last three years. It went up after the Paris Climate Accords. Every bad thing you've ever covered, tar sands, pipelines, Arctic oil drilling, they're bankrolling at all. So I think that as the year goes on, we're gonna see campaigns that supplement the fossil fuel divestment work that we've been doing now at $11 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have sold their stock and coal and oil and gas with a campaigns that really go after companies, banks like Chase. That money is the oxygen on what the, which the fires of global warming burn, I mean, period. So let's talk about that a little bit. So mm. I often talk about it on the show cuz our financial partner is Aspiration. Mm. And so Aspiration won't put any money into yep. fossil fuel money yep. in, in, in investments because they want to keep your money clean. And it's getting easier to do this kind of thing. I mean, I imagine they'll give you an ATM card you can stick in the wall all across the country too, you know? And there's amalgamated bank on the East Coast and beneficial mm -hmm. state bank on the West Coast and their credit unions. And there's some real possibilities now to bypass the five or six huge money center banks in New York that are deeply, deeply implicated in the destruction of the planet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I don't wanna get into a commercial for aspiration.com, mm -hmm. uh, but it, yeah, the ATM is free. So it's, it takes away all of the, the previous problems. Right. 
uh, in having to rely on those banks. But there's two, but the reason I brought it up is there's two different ways. One is pressure from you guys to the chases of the world to divest and to the Harvards mm -hmm. and the Yales and the yep. Stanfords, etc. And the other is for people to just go, well, I'm not gonna use a dirty bank. Yeah, we want them all to do it at the same day. So, <laughs> right. so we wanna make this point loudly. So keep tuned and there'll be a day before long. I mean, there's tens of millions of people in this country with a chase card in their wallet. And every one of those people has a pair of scissors at home. And a pair of scissors is gonna be an effective tool in fighting climate change. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, there was one thing in the article you wrote in The Guardian about this issue that really mm -hmm. struck me, which is that you really want them to stop, when you're, you said you, when you're in a hole, stop digging. And, and in this case, it's quite literal, right? Because you want them to stop digging, digging for oil holes. and gas, <laughs> yeah. etc. cetera. And, uh, and so of that I knew, but what really struck me was the, the point you made about if they finance those projects today, then those companies must do them for 20 to 30 years to get their money back and to get the profitability. Yep. So tell us a little bit about that. If you build a pipeline right now to take tar sands out of Alberta and ship it someplace, I mean, the, all the, the, the entire financing, the whole premise is it's gonna run for 40 years to make its money back, you know? That's, the, that's what you're telling investors. So if you put these markers in the ground, then you have a huge vested interest to keep fighting for them decade after decade in Washington and wherever else. Uh, uh, that's why stopping them before they go is so important. You'll remember that was the sort of logic at the start of the fight about the Keystone Pipeline. A fight that so far that pipeline's not been built. More to the point, uh, it convinced people they could stand up to big oil. And now every pipeline, every frack well, every coal mine, it all gets fought. Uh, and when it gets fought, even when we lose the fight, we slow things down. And when we slow things down, each month that passes, the engineers drop the price of a solar panel another percent or two. The price of sun and wind has fallen 90% in the last decade. It's the cheapest way to generate power. It's only the incumbent political advantage that the fossil fuel industry has that keeps it in the game. So I actually want to point out that Bill is maybe the only activist out there who has proven me wrong. Uh, so uh, I've always said it's always the money. I don't care. Like I love the activism. We encourage activism in a thousand different ways, and I try to direct people into the most productive way mm -hmm. of doing it. But just going in uh, beseeching and protesting uh, politicians never works. All they care about is the cash. The only time that it has ever worked was Keystone when you led it in front of the White House. <laughs> so it was a beautiful yeah. fight with so many people. And it was, and you know, it was really indigenous communities and farmers and ranchers and climate scientists and faith leaders and stuff. It shows what can happen if a you get everybody working in the same direction, and b if they have a story that makes sense to people. That pipeline is a 1,500 mile fuse to one of the biggest carbon bombs on the planet. Once you understand that, then you understand why, like in some kind of you know, action movie, you've got to snip the fuse. The same with this lifeline of money that the banks pump out to the fossil fuel industry. We got to cut it. Yeah. And Obama did not want to. And you no, guys, <laughs> yes. And you guys get, and look, when I say that, people get uh, upset. They're like, no, that's the beloved sainted Obama. No, he's well, driven by money and, look, and political interests. Look, Obama was, I mean, I, I was happy he got elected. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and we definitely have demonstrated at this point <laughs> that there's a lot worse out there. Yeah, I mean, he was pretty great in many ways. But that doesn't, I mean, politics doesn't consist of electing someone and then walking away. Uh, politics consists of, I mean, what we hope is that we elect precisely the people that we can then pressure to do good things. I mean, there's no use pressuring Donald Trump. He's not going to do good things. I mean, he, you know, he, he does bad things just for the sheer pleasure of doing bad things, <laughs> what it appears like. Yeah, Oh, yeah, I'm gonna own the libs by destroying the planet. <laughs> and when we're all dead, well, they'll be owned as well. Right. Okay, <laughs> that's one way to go. So, but let's stay on politics for a second because 
Look, the Republican Party is a lost cause. So mm -hmm. when I hear sometimes good, well-intentioned environmental activists talk to me about how they're gonna win over Republican senators, I laugh and laugh and laugh and say, well, you know, come back to me in five years when you realize you wasted all that mm -hmm. time and energy. Um, so, but that I don't think that's the primary problem. I think the primary problem is corporate Democrats. And because the Republicans are, our set thing, we, we know what we're getting yeah. with them. And you could beat them, you could win the Senate, you could win the House. But if you do, you're still not gonna get the Green New Deal because the Feinsteins, the Hickenloopers, the Michael Bennetts, they're all so gonna vote no. I think uh, I think Republicans are a big problem, I gotta say. I mean, I think that, but, and I think that there's enormous possibility now in the Democratic Party for change that seemed impossible to me. Well, it seemed impossible until uh, Bernie demonstrated in 2016 that there was a huge appetite for change. Now you can see that shifting. I mean, I, I helped write the, at his behest the party platform in 2016. And pretty much all the, well, I don't know about Biden, but all the Democratic candidates, serious candidates for president are more progressive on these issues than the party was in 2016, and that was the most progressive platform we've seen. What really matters is voters making clear what they demand. The fact that climate change is polling as the number one issue is the reason that pretty much every major candidate has said, again, again I think with the exception of Biden, that They'll, they want to try and get rid of fracking, that they're going to stop public lands from being used for coal and gas and oil. A president could actually do that, and public lands fall under their purview. And if they did, <coughs> public, public, US public lands are the fifth biggest. They come after China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States as a whole, biggest source of carbon on the planet. On day one, someone could do that. That was considered nuts even three or four years ago. And this just demonstrates what happens when people begin to really make clear what they want out of the world. Especially, let me add, young people, voters under 35, this isn't just the biggest issue, it's the biggest issue with a bullet. Yeah, so Bill, last thing on that, look, uh is the Republican Party a bigger problem than the Democratic Party? Of course, but it's like when people tell me, why are you criticizing the Pentagon instead of Al Qaeda? Because there's nothing I can do about <laughs> Al Qaeda, right? <laughs> Al Qaeda is a given evil. Yeah. The Republicans are a given evil, yeah. but all they care about is oil money. They don't, they will never care about the voters, ever, ever, until this party is extinct and then we get a new version of the Republican Party. So it's it's a waste of time. Whereas there is the potential that you could do something about right, corporate which Democrats. Right, why it's so good that the Democratic Party, I mean, look, I have huge problems with like the organized Democratic Party. It killed me last summer to watch the kids from the Sunrise Movement get the Democratic Party to agree to stop taking fossil fuel contributions only to have the DNC six weeks later change the policy and go back to taking that money. I mean, that kind of stuff just, I mean, I, it just makes one sad because we're at, we're, we're, it's not like we have many more presidential cycles to get but, this all right. But Bill, that's why I go back to, it's also partly the media because when I say, for example, if you elect John Hickenlooper in Colorado, we're screwed. Where he calls the Green New Deal Stalinist. You, you, you do know that John Hickenlooper literally drank a glass of fracking fluid to demonstrate his support for it, yes. <laughs> yeah, and he also yeah. took a lot of checks to demonstrate yeah. his support for it. But somehow just that image of someone yeah. saying, I'll, I'll drink this. But that's, but that's precisely the problem. We have a crisis and we have a, a Democrat who is leading significantly in that race saying that he is not going to vote for Green New Deal under any circumstance, who's taking a quarter of a million dollars from the fossil fuel industry. And yet, and if you criticize him- Who the, came out against the- really powerful attempt last year to get a, just a setback for fracking wells from people's homes in Colorado. So yeah, I, no love lost there. Yeah, uh, but yet the rest of the media and the Democratic establishment go, how dare you, our beloved Hickenlooper. 
And are you guys are all on the same team? Well, no, we're not. We're not on the same team. The good news, one of the good things about the primary process was watching Jay Inslee, who really is smart about these things, uh, uh, sort of lay out the logic of some of the places we need to go. And that was good. Um, this is gonna, I mean, the Democrat, Republican, I mean, the fight here is basically physics versus money, you know? Um, and I, I understand that political reality is a really important thing, obviously. But reality, reality in the end trumps it, you know, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, all of it matters. The political reality is you have to vote for people like Andrew Romanoff over Hickenlooper. Otherwise, we're not going to get these things passed. And the other reality is pay attention to Wall Street as well as Washington. Absolutely right. And you know, we didn't get to so much. Uh, you, the carbon bubble that you talk about is so important. But vote and vote with your money. If both of those things are. And we all have to do our parts. And you know, you get you throw away the aluminum can, and you should, and you recycle the paper, and you should. But, but doing that with your money is actually even more important. Well, and, and at this point, vote. at this point, the most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual, join together with others in those movements that actually present some challenge to the status quo. Yeah, absolutely. All right, 350.org. Bill McKibben, American hero. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you, Appreciate brother. It.